Hello again and welcome to the ACCESS webinar series, Navigating the Highway of ICD-10-CM. I'm Jennifer Gibson, your presenter today, and I am a registered nurse with over 20 years of home health experience, and I am coding and OASIS certified. Today we're going to be covering part 7 of 12, which covers mental diagnoses and disorders and how we code those in home health. Of course, our objectives today are to understand why the proper coding is important to begin with, and then we're going to learn who's responsible for applying and assigning those diagnoses, and then we'll study that guidance for coding common mental and nervous system issues in ICD-10. Then we'll apply the knowledge that we've learned to common home health scenarios so that we can practice what we've learned. All right, now we're going to talk a little bit briefly about um, who selects the diagnoses and, and that kind of thing. If you want more information on that topic, you'll need to go back to the first part of this 12-part series because we really cover in depth the uh, guidance and conventions for coding ICD-10 and who's responsible according to the OASIS and so on. So this is just a brief overview of who does the coding and who's supposed to sequence and all of that because we like to make sure that if you're using these as training webinars for your staff that they get that little bit because they may not do this on a daily basis, okay? So according to your OASIS C1 guidance manual, selection of the primary and secondary diagnoses must be made by the assessing clinician. And CMS does that for a very calculated reason, and that is that the clinician who sees the patient is expected to understand that patient's overall medical condition and care needs before selecting the diagnoses. And those diagnoses are based on the assessment findings of the clinician, the medical record, and input from the physician. According to the OASIS C1 guidance manual, that assessing clinician should be the person who records the primary and secondary diagnosis in 1021 and 1023. And then according to CMS guidance, again, the coder can add the actual code after the assessing clinician has determined the primary and secondary diagnosis. But that clinician's responsible for assessing the patient's needs, seeing what the primary reason for home health is, putting that in the primary disease diagnosis spot in 1021, and then sequencing all the secondary diagnoses according to acuity in 1023. So how do we get the right diagnosis? When we're trying to select the right code, we need to consider the following criteria. And the assessing clinician may not know all of this. That's why your policies at your agency really need to dictate how you coordinate the difference between what the clinician wrote and what the guidelines for coding say. And most of the time that's done by some type of form where you have the initial responses in 1021 and 1023 and 1017 and all the other coding M items. You have what the clinician put down first and then you'll have another column as to what the coder has done as far as resequencing those and the whys, and then you'd have a signature line for the clinician in the field and a signature line for the coder where they've discussed and agreed upon the changes and so on, and they both sign that, and it should be well documented and attached in the patient's chart. So when you're getting that right diagnosis, you have to select the correct code, and you have to keep all of this criteria in mind. First of all, it must comply with the coding guidelines. We are to code only unresolved diagnoses, we're to code those diagnoses that are relevant to what we're doing for the home health patient's plan of care. We are to code those that are supported by the patient's medical record documentation, and that means the physician's medical record documentation and or any query documentation that we've called back over to the doctor's office and ask questions and gotten a more definitive diagnosis. And when you do query, by the way, you'll need to document with whom you spoke, their full name and title, what you asked, what reply you got, and then you'll need to sign that with your full name and title as well. That's legally how you do a physician query. Um, the criteria will also need to make sure that you comply with sequencing requirements that your etiology and manifestation codes are sequenced and reported properly, that we avoid nonspecific, ambiguous, or symptom codes when possible. Now, the criteria for that primary diagnosis that goes in M1021, that diagnosis should be most related to that current plan of care, 
if there is more than one diagnosis being treated for that episode, then the diagnosis that represents the most acute condition and requires the most services should be assigned as your primary diagnosis. In other words, it's the chief reason for home health, and it requires the most intensive skilled services. And we also know we shouldn't use a Z code unless it's absolutely necessary. Um, when you use a Z code as the primary diagnosis because it has now replaced an issue that is resolved, you'll put the resolved condition over in 1025B, some kind of thing that's going to be a risk adjustment or risk factor uh, consideration. Otherwise, you don't even put it in 1025. A couple of examples I can think of with the Z codes that might be primary would be aftercare for a, a knee replacement, for example. So that knee replacement resolved the underlying osteoarthritis. Maybe they had the knee replacement in the left knee. So that resolved arthritis of the left knee. Then you could code arthritis of the left knee in 1025B, but you wouldn't sequence it down in 1023. Another example would be a Z code would be if you're doing attention to a Foley catheter or urinary device and the patient has MS. You're not there to treat MS. They're not going to get therapy. You're only there for the catheter. You would put a Z code for status code or attention to code rather in that case uh, as your primary diagnosis. And you could also put MS down as a secondary diagnosis because that's why the patient has a catheter. But you wouldn't put MS as the primary diagnosis because you're not treating MS. You're treating the effect of the MS, which is the bladder retention, bladder problem, and your attention to the Foley catheter is why you're there. Now, for your secondary diagnoses, those are all the ones that line up in 1023. When you're deciding which ones should go there, you need to consider the following criteria. These are diagnoses that didn't meet the criteria for primary diagnosis, but they are addressed in the plan of care and they affect the patient's responsiveness to treatment and rehab. There are some things that we would always code, for example, in that spot. If they have hypertension or diabetes or they have COPD or CHF or any myriad of chronic comorbid conditions that might affect that patient's outcome. We may not be there to focus on diabetes. Uh, we may be there to focus on wound care. But certainly if they have a wound and they have diabetes, that diabetes could get out of control and that would definitely affect wound healing. So we need to go ahead and code that diabetes as a secondary diagnosis. And the list in the secondary diagnoses, you may have several different problems. Uh, those are sequenced according to the acuity of that patient's needs. All right, so again, coding basics. When you start getting ready to look up codes, you'll always start in the alphabetic index first. A couple things to note about the alphabetic index. When you see a dash at the end of a code entry, that means additional characters are needed. And sometimes you'll see after that uh, condition diagnosis is listed, it will say C or C also. Make sure you take that as a command and not a suggestion because the information that's referenced after C or C also entries, they quite often will give you more specific information or they'll give you additional pieces of information which will help you arrive at a correct code. Now, once you've found the code in the alphabetic index, you never want to code from the alphabetic alone. You're going to flip to the second part of the book where the chapters are laid out. That's called the tabular index. And you'll want to check that code in the tabular because you can't get a final code from the alphabetic. You can only get that from the tabular index. And the tabular index also contains a lot of guidance information that will tell you what kinds of codes need to be done and, and how it needs to be sequenced and other types of guidance. And there are four places you're going to want to check that guidance when you're in the tabular. Number one, the chapter level. So when you get over to say chapter 19, after you see the introduction to that chapter, you flip a page or two perhaps, you're going to see the chapter title and there may or may not be guidance that applies to all of the diagnoses codes in that chapter. And the only place you're going to find that is in the chapter level introduction uh, in your book. There's also chapter block level guidance. Uh, each chapter is broken into blocks of diagnoses that represent the same types of etiology and processes. And at the chapter block level, quite often, there will be guidance that applies to all of the codes in that block. For example, the chapter block I-10 to I-15, those are hypertensive 
um, diagnoses that all stem for hypertension, you'll see there's chapter block level guidance. Right after that little title that says I-10 to I-15 hypertensive diseases, then you'll see guidance that applies to all of the codes from I-10 to I-15. You'll also want to check for guidance at the three character category level. For example, when you get into E11, uh, those are all the codes for diabetes mellitus type 2. There may be uh, guidance that applies to all of the E11 codes at that particular three character category level. And finally, when you get to the final code level, there may be conventions to follow that have to do with that code itself. Okay, so check those four places to make sure you're coding properly. All right, next we're going to get into the guidance for mental disorders. When you're coding mental disorders in home health, you have to really understand what your focus of care is. And this is again why the assessing clinician is responsible for sequencing these diagnoses because that assessing clinician is the person with help of the physician, of course, who decides what it is that we're seeing the patient for. Is that primary reason for home care the mental diagnosis? Or are we doing psychological nursing for the patient if the psych diagnosis is used primary? And then the other question you have to know the answer to is whether or not the psychological condition or the physiological condition is that impacting that patient's rehab potential. So again, what are you seeing the patient for? Is it a mental disease or is it a physiological disease? And then which one are we treating more? Are we sending psych nursing for the mental disease or are we seeing them for, say, diabetes mellitus, but they also have dementia? Okay, so I got to figure out which one needs the most care and sequence that appropriately. If you are going to code a mental disorder as a diagnosis, make sure that diagnosis is confirmed by the physician. That's the first rule to know. Just because you have um, medications for depression or just because they have a PHQ2 score that indicates they have depression, that does not mean you can code depression. You must confirm that diagnosis with the physician. Many medications can be used for different things. They may not be used for what they're branded for. Um, and we see that all the time with psychiatric medications especially. So make sure you confirm the diagnosis with the physician. Now, if your mental disorder is the primary diagnosis, you should be providing psychiatric nursing care. Your confirmed mental disorder diagnosis should be listed as secondary diagnoses. If you're not sending out psychiatric nursing care, then any confirmed mental diagnosis has to be listed as a secondary diagnosis because it certainly will impact their rehab potential, right? So you need to make sure you have all of that information sequenced properly. There is sequencing guidance for many of the diagnoses in the mental and neurological chapters of ICD-10. You need to make sure you follow the includes and excludes notes that you see. For example, at chapter block F1 through F9, mental disorders due to known physiological conditions, there's guidance that says uh, you have to code the underlying condition first. For example, at F02, dementia and diseases classified elsewhere, it tells you to code first underlying physiological condition such as dementia with Lewy bodies. Now you need to make sure also that you have the correct mental diagnosis from the physician. Many disorders sound similar, but they're completely different disease processes. For example, the disease is schizophrenia, schizotypal disorder, cyclic schizophrenia, and schizoaffective disorder. They all have that schizo component sound to them, but they're all different disease processes, so make sure you have the right one. Depression, again, should only be coded when the physician has confirmed the diagnosis and you can't code depression based solely on any of the following items. Just because of your PHQ2 or other depression screening results, you can't code depression based solely on your medication list or on the signs and symptoms that you see. You would report those, of course, to the physician if you don't have a definitive diagnosis and record any diagnosis that you receive in that conversation, record with whom you spoke and their title and what the doctor said, uh, and then you can use the diagnosis after that. But you certainly can't do it without having that confirmation from the doctor. Now, another thing that we see happen and, and see coded quite often in home health is patients who have depression and anxiety. 
So you really kind of need to know based on what the physician says and how they document that you code that two different ways. If, they, if the physician does not relate the depression and anxiety, you have to code those separately. When the physician documentation says depression with anxiety, according to the ICD-10 guidelines, it is considered related. So if you see depression with, that means the physician has connected those two items. And in that case, you use a combination code, which is F41.8, other specified anxiety disorders, that's the code you'll use for the depression with anxiety. Otherwise, if it just says in the documentation depression and then it lists anxiety somewhere else, you don't automatically assume they're related and code them to F418. It's only when it's documented as depression with anxiety. The with is what connects the two. All right, so we're going to do some practice now with the coding that we've learned, the coding guidance. So let's get right into these. So let's look at our first practice scenario. Your patient's an 81-year-old male referred to home health for medication management and teaching the caregiver about meds and home safety. The patient is documented as having post-infarction dementia and has been forgetting to take his medications. He's also wandering in the afternoons and during the night, and he fell three days ago. Query reveals the underlying condition for dementia is bilateral carotid artery occlusion. So in this case, we have uh, an underlying etiology. We have the uh, manifestation of that, and we also have some problems with wandering and falls. So in this case, your answer would be primary diagnosis, I65.23, occlusion and stenosis of bilateral carotid arteries. We have to code the underlying condition first from the F01 category. Then that is followed by the manifestation code F01.51, vascular dementia with behavioral disturbance. And then you also will code, there's guidance at F01.51 to use additional code for the actual behavior. And that code is Z91.83, wandering and diseases classified elsewhere. And finally, we have the code for history of falls, Z91.81. Okay, let's do practice number two. In this case, your patient is a 68-year-old female who is admitted for diabetic teaching after beginning Lantus insulin daily for hyperglycemia. The admitting RN notes that the patient takes Wellbutrin and her PHQ2 scores as risk for depression. So we know that the patient is at risk for depression. She has some symptoms. She's on medications. The point we want to make here is that you can't code depression because we don't have a diagnosis, right? And we can't base that only on the medications because Wellbutrin can be taken for other things as well. So in this case, we're going to code this patient as only two codes. We have E11.65 for type 2 diabetes mellitus with hyperglycemia followed by Z79.4, long-term use of insulin. And of course, we would want to see in the chart documentation somewhere in that narrative and maybe even a, a communication note or something to the physician reporting that the patient has symptoms of depression and that you've reported it to the physician and that you know she's already on Wilbutrin and so on and so forth, uh, but you're letting the physician know that that appears to continue to be a problem but you can't code that unless you get the diagnosis back within the five-day uh, assessment window that you have when you fill out an OASIS Start of Care. In other words, if you fill out that OASIS Start of Care on Monday, Monday is day zero. You have five days to coordinate and query from that time frame on. So Monday's day zero, Tuesday is day, is day one, Wednesday is day two, Thursday is day three, Friday is day four, and Saturday is day five. So you have by end of the day on Saturday to try and get the diagnosis of depression and document that. And if you do so, you can then add depression on that oasis. However, if you don't, you cannot code that depression. Even though you suspect it or you may have confirmation, you may have verbal information from the patient that, yes, I've had depression in the past, da-da-da-da-da. You must have that documentation in the chart from the physician somewhere. 
Okay, practice number three, your patient's a 69-year-old who had a stroke about a month ago and now has pseudobulbar effect as a result. Nursing is needed to teach on new medications and to teach the caregiver about disease processes and home safety measures. The patient also has hypertension and is a fall risk. In this case, we have to code sequelae of the cerebral infarction first. So we have an I69.398 code. We don't know any specifics about the stroke, so we would look this up in the alphabetic as sequelae stroke, uh, and that's how we would find that. And then following I69.398, we have to code F48.2 pseudobulbar effect. Now, this is one of those strange exception codes in that normally you would put what you see first and then the, the sequelae, but the guidance at I-69 and at F-48.2 tell us we must sequence it in this order, okay? So you're going to have your sequelae of cerebral infarction first, then you're going to have your pseudobulbar effect code, then following that you would have hypertension, I-10 coded, and last, your Z-91.2. 81 code, the history of falls code, is the same code that we use to also indicate the patient is at risk for falls. The Z91.81 code is used exactly the same way as in ICD-9 V15.88 in that it is used for when a patient has a history of falls or they are at risk of falls as well. Okay, and our last practice for this particular series is uh, number four, the patient is a 60-year-old female recently diagnosed with early onset Alzheimer's. Her spouse knew something was up because she kept getting confused and was sleepwalking all the time. Patient has continued to wander at night and her spouse does not understand the disease. Physician has ordered nursing for teaching on the disease process and for new medication teaching on Namenda and Aricept. The patient also has COPD due to a history of tobacco smoking dependence and hypertension. So let's look at how we answered number four. You have an etiology manifestation code pairing again in this case, and your etiology or the underlying process goes first, which is in this case your Alzheimer's disease with early onset G30.0. Following that is the manifestation, and the manifestation in this case is the dementia, F02.81. In this case, the patient does have wandering, so we're going to choose 81, which is the dementia and other diseases classified elsewhere with behavioral disturbances. And then you've got another guidance there at that code that tells you to use additional code, which means it must be sequenced right after, to identify the behavior, which is such as wandering. So we code Z91.83, wandering and diseases classified elsewhere next. Then we're going to put the COPD J44.9, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease unspecified, followed by hypertension I10, and there's guidance at the I10 chapter block level that tells us to also code any tobacco exposure or use and so on. So we would have last listed Z87.891, personal history of tobacco dependence. In conclusion, again, I hope you've enjoyed your webinar series today on coding mental diagnoses in home health. We thank you for attending the Access ICD-10 coding webinar series, and we hope you'll come back to join us for the next part of our series, part eight, uh, when it's coming very soon as well. In part eight, we're going to be coding neoplasms, and so we hope there's a lot that you can learn from that as well. In the meantime, if you have questions or you require more information, feel free to give me a call at uh, the number that's shown here. You have my direct extension, or you may email as well at jgibson at access.com. I will tell you as much as I travel, your best opportunity to reach me will be by email, and I'm happy to answer you as time permits. Uh, when you're just learning a topic, you will have questions, and that comes with the territory when you're learning a new concept. So feel free to ask those questions as they come up, okay? Thank you again for joining us, and I uh, appreciate everything that you do in your home care jobs, regardless of what that job might be. If you weren't there to do that job, 
then our disabled and needing patients who are homebound would not be able to get the care they deserve. So thank you again so much for being there for those patients. And we will see you again soon. Okay, thank you. Thank you for joining our webinar today. We know that your time is valuable and are happy you chose to spend it with Access. At Access, we're proud to offer a variety of training resources to keep you in the know on industry news and updates. You can register for additional trainings and watch on-demand training videos through our software or at access.com, where you can also find tutorials, online manuals, and answers to frequently asked questions. We're always just a call or click away. Feel free to call us at 866-795-5990 or email us at support at access.com. All of our expert client experience representatives have a home health care background. They've been in your shoes and know the industry inside and out. Join the conversation and connect with us on our social channels. We'll keep you up to date with what's going on in the industry and share resources to help you grow your business and improve your patient outcomes. Thank you again for your time today and for choosing Access, your provider of complete home health care services, software, and solutions.